Kira Muratova was prominent for her persistent cinematic exploration of excessive movements and histrionic gestures. In my doctoral thesis, I introduced Muratova's aesthetics as a cinema of gesture. In this presentation, I'm addressing the correlation between the visible and the tactile, and revisiting the cinematic action in terms of manual work occurring on the surface. Laura Marx, in the skin of the film, proposes a new type of the film image, in which vision is intertwined with a sense of touch. Marx's haptic visuality is based on Gilles Deleuze's notion of time image, in particular his tacticine, exemplified on the close-ups of hands. Marx argues that body fragmentation is almost unnecessary to evoke a sense of touch. Images become tactile also when they foreground textures and their material qualities, rather than easily identifiable objects and figures. Marx employs epidermis vocabulary. Touch is a sense located on the surface of the body. It is not out of place to note that the word film derived from the Old English filmen, meaning membrane, thin skin, or a thin layer of some substance. The nature of cinema consists in flat surfaces, of seemingly impenetrable screens and of flat film tapes. How do gestures form ornaments and imprints on the skin of the film? Don't monochrome colors reveal the structure, curve and flexion in an abstract and yet precise way, like the black font on a white sheet of paper? Isn't Muratova's preference for black and white rooted exactly in this cinematic graphicism? After her black and white features, Muratova switches to color in 1979 in Getting to Know the Big Wild World. Most critics relate this shift to her discovery of decorativeness, exuberant colors, extravagant textures and overabundant details. Muratova herself admits that this shift occurred a few years earlier. Crucial for me was meeting Rustam Hamdamov, when he told me that the necklace shouldn't be filled with beads and at some places the thread should be visible. It was like a revelation to me, and I thought, now I see how easy it is to reveal the construction of the world, that the beads are actually strung on the thread. It was then that, it, that I became interested in external sites, in costumes, in adornment. In the script to the unrealized film Watch Your Dreams Attentively or Touch, this transition to ornamentalism is articulated by the protagonist painter. She says, My eyes recently need diverse colors and a great number of distracting objects. In the past, I used to like simplicity, clarity and white walls. Curious enough, Muratova's cinema had undergone exactly the same shift in the 70s. Yet, years later, Muratova made two films entirely in black and white, Chekhov's Motives and The Tuna, and two, mixing monochrome and color, asthenic syndrome and the eternal return. Muratova's interest in the nature of the material environment goes back to her first films. Touch is one of the main senses through which her characters explore the world. In brief encounters, both Nadia and Valentina touch and slide with their fingers over the surface of the things and look at their hands. The gesture serves as a transitional image between two narrative levels, the main plot and flashbacks. Tactility gradually transforms into recollection and vision. The complementarity of the two senses, touch and sight, and the supremacy of the former is featured in the short film by the steep ravine. Here, a blind man, Kostya, claims to see colors and to feel sonorous vibrations of things with the tips of his fingers. He says, the sunflowers have their own reflection. So does the eye, and there is a thin wave coming from every object towards my face. The radiant tactility of things alludes here to a more original and true perception, as opposed to sight, the rational, distant and limited cognition of the world. The tradition of conjunction of blindness and extrasensory perception is deeply inherent in European culture. From the mythological blind prophet Tiresias to Homer to Milton to Rilke, etc. In the field of cinema, it was Eisenstein who considered touch as a supreme faculty of knowing the world. He called such perception nocturnal vision. As Jan Polsky observes, 
for all his passion for painting, for all the visual bias inherent in his cinematic profession, Eisenstein finally opted for the blindness of the seer. In like manner, Muratova's blind man Kostya acquires the status of the paragon of an exceptional synesthetic sensorium. A similar dichotomy of the Cartesian seeing and the authentic touch is thematized in brief encounters. Here, Valentina, an emancipated educated woman, with a piercing gaze and articulated speech, is juxtaposed both with a reticent Nadia and with Maxime. The first encounter between Nadia and Valentina is based on misrecognition. When Nadia appears on her doorstep, Valentina mistakes her for a new housekeeper. Without letting Nadia say a word, Valentina overwhelms her with suggestions. Maya Efimovna sent you to me, right? Have you arrived from the countryside? Nadia is practically pronounced to a housekeeper and silently agrees to play this role. While caressing Maxim's face, Valentina is desperately trying to look through the surface of his visage. She says, I don't know you at all. Here you are, lying, and I see your eyes, cheeks, mouth. You're lying here and thinking of something. What are you thinking about? In another flashback, she says that she simply wants to look at, at him, but he feels uneasy under her penetrating gaze and rebels. I don't want to be examined under a microscope. I'm not a worm. I live with half-closed eyes and I'm good with it. And if you love me, you shall look at me with enamored eyes, with blind eyes. Let's kiss and so on. Maxim's refusal to scrutinize his thoughts reduces him to an impenetrable surface that cannot be grasped, but only approached by touch. The recurring image of not seeing transforms into the one of blinding glare. Through a long transitional sequence to Valentina's memory, her body and face are illuminated by a light, making her seem incapable of grasping what she's looking at. The intensity of her memories block the process of signification. The other can neither be objectified nor rationally cognized. In an overexposed image, the film reaches the limits of the visible and thus queries the allegedly unquestionable visuality of its own medium. The contemporary French phenomenologist Jean-Luc Marion describes the face, which he calls icon, as a saturated phenomenon. An icon never runs out of meanings, since it exceeds all of them. In a face-to-face -face encounter, this, the eye is bedazzled by the other's gaze. Marion defines the experience of saturated phenomena in terms of visual excess transcending visibility. Intuition is no longer exposed in the concept. It saturates it and transits it overexposed, invisible, unreadable, by an excess of light. Bedazzlement, taken literally, as a physical incapacity to see clearly when in love, is realized in getting to know. The main female character, Luba, gets a mote in her eye, and Misha, the man she's falling in love with, helps remove it. The two are filmed from different perspectives, producing the effect of the camera, embracing and caressing them, and partaking in their tender interaction. The scene is set in a concrete plant, the sparks from welding in the background and complete absence of sound increase the erotic tension. A casual gesture appears as a highly intimate act. Later, the night day begins with a long poetic sequence of Luba's body illuminated by the headlights of Misha's lorry. Misha switches them on and off, but Luba seems to enjoy these tender light strokes. Mesmerized by light, she squints but moves forward, feeling the air with her hands. Remarkably, the motif of blindness appears in many Muratova's later films, albeit rather episodically and without any romantic connotations. Rather, it indicates intrigue, crime and ignorance. In the tuna, the scammer André speaks to his victim, the rich lady with a dog, Anna Sergeyevna, and in the blurred background, we see two children playing blind man's buff. This hardly noticeable detail is an ironic synecdoche to the entire film. A successful deception requires not only a clever trickster, but also a victim willing to play along. In short, it requires the readiness to shut one's own eyes to the deceit. The film Change of Fate begins with a scene of a double sight impairment. The main character, Maria, 
wearing a carnival eye mask, is asleep in the chair. Her illicit lover, Alexander, wakes her with a kiss. Later, we find out that this sequence is a fictitious story Maria is telling to her lawyer, as she claims that Alexander attempted to rape her, so she killed him in self-defense. In reality, Maria committed the murder out of jealousy and made up the rape story to mislead the investigation. At the end, Maria is acquitted. Her make-believe story proves to be a story of a devious stratagem successfully carried out. Another notable theme in Muratova's work is knitting. Her characters are frequently occupied with this traditionally feminine gendered handwork, although in Muratova it rather signals again an intrigue. The female protagonist of the short film Letter to America pretends to be a prostitute to trick her landlord, who demands the rent. She asks the landlord to wait in the kitchen while she would have sex in the living room. The absurdity of the situation increases when she returns to her lover and begins to knit instead. Then she picks up some money from her stash and hands it to the landlord, making him feel awkward and guilty. Knitting here is an equivalent to killing time and a pretty much nonsensical yet effective scam. Throughout Muratova's films, there are other variations of the gesture of knitting. One can certainly interpret this in societal cultural terms as a typical activity in the situation of the socialist economic shortage, but this explanation might miss the point. Knitting renders bodily movements on screen more intricate. It diverts our attention to the process of making as such, very much in the sense of Shklovsky's art as technique, of which Muratova's own artistic credo is reminiscent. The more artificiality, the more art, she admits. In Eternal Homecomings, the female character twiddles a piece of tangle cord while listening to her former classmate lament the impossibility of making the right choice to stay with his wife or his lover. The woman's nervous and futile gesture functions as a symptom of his malaise, the hesitation in his private life and his annoying intrusion asking her to make this hard decision for him. The woman's fussy tinkering with the cord merely feigns action where nothing can be done or even said. Evil is interwoven into the pattern of a carpet, Pontus Muratova, and to pull this thread out we must destroy the whole fabric. Tapestry is perhaps the most appropriate metaphor for Muratova's haptic cinema. It contains the idea of surface, cover, ornament, line structure, heterogeneity of textures and colors, and, above all, the idea of handicraft. Textile images are a prominent feature of Muratova's visual vocabulary. Colorful prints, folds, frills, flounces, curtains, drapes, rugs, veils, lace, feather, sequins, pearls and crystals. Accumulation of various objects and seemingly worthless trinkets, be blow, is another trademark of Muratova's mise-en-scene, corresponding in more general terms to her propensity for the aesthetics of kitsch. Heaps of objects in incapacious, messy rooms hinder free movements. The characters are forced to adjust their gestures to the things, to lean, to sidestep, to slide over pieces of furniture. The bodies are placed among grotesque piles of documents and kitschy bric-a-brac. They are hidden behind plant tendrils and semi-transparent tree screens. The characters get entangled in the texture of the world. It effaces the ontological difference between the fore and background, humans and things, the centre and periphery, presence and disappearance. The film two-in-one opens with one of the protagonists reciting Hamlet's soliloquy. The viewer's attention is captivated by the performance in the proscenium, while the essential remains virtually hidden in the background. There is a hardly visible corpse hanging in the tendrils of the backdrops. Explaining this phenomenon in Muratova, critics often resort to phenomenology, precisely to Maurice Merleau-Ponty's concept of flesh, which sees and is seen at the same time, sees itself seeing and feels itself feeling, as well as to his idea of chiasm, a crossover, intertwining of a subjective on objective worlds. Merleau-Ponty writes, visible and mobile, my body is a thing among things, it is caught in the fabric of the world. The world is made of the same stuff as the body. 
Muratova recreates the human interaction with the surrounding things in terms of a co-equal co-presence of two things inseparable from one another. Emma Widis interprets this in a nearly claustrophobic sense. The characters are pictured caught within a world of material textures from which they cannot be extricated. I think that Muratova's chiastic structures and images attest to, first, ornamentalism and, secondly, to a kind of visual egalitarianism, to clarify this briefly. Alois Riegel emphasizes that the basic rules of ornament consist in rhythm, succession and repetition. As a result, it can potentially develop endlessly. Riegel calls ornament infinite rapport. We can think of all Muratova's varied kinds of repetitions and reduplications, for instance. What is, however, even more important is that Riegel elucidates the essence of ornament as a relationship of dependence between the ornament itself, the figurative part, and its background. The pattern is readable only in relation to its ground. In Muratova, with her genuine fascination for things elevated to the status of characters, the ornamental principle results in bodies and objects rivaling for the field of visibility, since the humans and non-humans appear to be axiologically equivalent. It goes in both directions, objectifying the human and humanizing things. I would consider this visual egalitarianism as a crucial part of Muratova's orientation towards posthumanism and new materialism. Finally, Muratova continuously deconstructed any stable categories such as character, identity, plot, action, meaning, utility. Her films exemplify the Deleuzean concept of cinematic modernity, in fact postmodernity. Instead of action, it offers the attitudes and postures of the body, its ephemeral states and gestures. The body and the matter are depicted in the process of osmosis, of transformation and differentiation, of arising from and vanishing into invisibility, in short, in the process of incessant becoming.